I think that due to all things that we can do today with a microscope, we can uh, change this sentence in this microscopium extraordinarium nominare libuit. And since the microscope is sort of a star, uh, if you watch to the sky, you can see these two constellations related to Galilei that are microscopium and telescopium. I don't know if you have ever seen them. And since with the microscope, uh, mainly we produce images, a lot of other data, but mainly images, I'd like to bring to your attention this sentence by this sketcher, Yogi Berra, that is very interesting because since he was a catcher, he really had to observe in a very sharp way and pay great attention to the small dynamics of this guy that was launching the ball in order to understand where to move. And so I think that we are within this framework with a microscope, biological cells, and other objects we are interested in. So today, I will try to discuss with you about fluorescence. I don't know which is the background, but I know that background is uh, not homogeneous. So I will try to give some uh, data about basic of fluorescence and application and so on. So I'm sorry for those of you that are skilled in, in fluorescence. But as first start, I think that we have this start that is related to the fact that with the optical microscope, uh, we can see what is invisible, not only in terms of, uh, not only in terms of dimension, but also in terms of interaction with the electromagnetic wave we are using to probe matter. Uh, this problem of having biological objects, the one we are interested in, transparent, was solved by Zernik, as you know, and you had lessons about phase contrast. So you can get some contrast from objects that are normally transparent. And later, introducing some markers in the sample that can be coupled with this kind of approach that are fluorescent. And then later, you can mix approaches and you can move to making the invisible visible in colors. And colors are not only for beauty. Colors are because colors related to fluorescent molecules and biological objects are, have a very strict relationship with function and structures we are interested in in biological systems. Now, we are working, uh, when you, are, you know about the electromagnetic spectrum, we are working in this very small region. Uh, I have a specific re reason for working in this region. I come from Genoa, and colors of my favorite football team are red and blue. And this is the reason why I focus my research in the visible light, so from red and blue. Um, and when you have interactions, you have absorption, you can have scattering, you touch at all these points. And absorption, related to absorption, we will see something about biological systems, and then we will move to fluorescence. In this region, that is from red to blue, you have some uh, biological systems that absorb light, and so that in case can produce contrast, that are in the near infrared, like hemoglobin, lipids, and water, and then in the ultraviolet. Uh, main, most important, I think, is DNA, and then you have uh, some elements in the ultraviolet that not only have absorbance, but also produce fluorescence. This can be of interest. Of course, we like, uh, not from the microscopy point of view, but from uh, our living state point of view, that biological macromolecules we have inside do not absorb light. Otherwise, our temperature under the sunlight would increase too much. 
And you know that within this, uh, or probably you know that within this window, you want to avoid uh, shining light on your system in the ultraviolet because you have 220 and 260 absorption of protein and DNA. And so in case you shine light there, you can change their structure and so the functioning. And on the other side, if you move to the near infrared, you have some water absorption windows and then you have some collagen absorbing there. But as you see here, also you have signal uh, that region. And hemoglobin is very important and we don't want to touch this when we plan to go into living system also using the microscope because we can change oxygenation and we can change conditions there and we don't want to do this. So the main reason we are using the optical microscope is because uh, I've not asked you to, be, to become solid, to be physically sectioned, to be metallized and to be injected with electrons in order to have some contrast. I simply can follow what's going on using light. Okay. So these are the windows that we will not, we'll try not to touch too much. And using the microscope, and so this was an observation using, again, uh, a contrast there, is something that is, does not induce too many transformation within the sample. You heard about uh, the optical microscope, so you know about all this stuff. You had uh, beautiful lessons last week. I've seen all the slides there. And now let me go into the optical microscopy scenario for the topic of today, that is fluorescence. So the idea here is that within this scenario that is rather complicated, or complex, I don't know, uh, you have two main categories. And today we are mainly interested to this one related to probes approach. And I hope that I will be able to convince you that when we talk today, um, I don't know if in the appropriate way or not, but we use this term, super resolution in microscopy, we are mainly focused on preparation of the sample, on the probes and their properties more than in the optics needed for producing super resolved images or images that we call super resolved. And so we will try to move in this domain. So fluorescence. I don't know if you have been here at the Cappella Sistina, uh, but if you have seen this painting, you cannot escape that this color looks different from all the others. It looks a little bit brighter or something attracting you more than other colors. Because molecules making this color have also another property. When you shine visible light, you can see this. When you shine ultraviolet, you can see fluorescence from there. And when you use fluorescence, and you use fluorescence with a biological cell, you, can, you take advantage of uh, a lot of science made in order to have, biochemically speaking, something that is very specific for things you are interested in within the cell, or in cell aggregates, or in cell aggregated in tissues and organs. You can, really, you can be really very specific. And so you know, uh, most of you probably know, that fluorescence is the light emitted uh, within a finite duration subsequent to the absorption of electromagnetic energy. And now we are shining energy in, in the visible. And situation is uh, not so complicated. Usually, usually what we do is to excite our molecules, so to shine 
to send energy using light, so to shine light at the appropriate energy, to bring the molecule to an excited state, and then within these uh, time scales, waiting for the decay. And you can have decay or not. There are some parameters regarding the fluorescent molecules uh, ruling these. But usually what we exploit is excitation of the molecule, some waiting time, and then back emitting a signal within this time scale that is 10 minus 9, 10 minus 7 second down to the ground state. And then you can start again this process. Like you, when one is talking too much, you stop listening, but then you can get a coffee and you can start again. And with fluorescent molecules, sometime after 40,000, for example, cycle for fluorescent, they stop emitting forever. Some of them can restart, but most of them stop forever. We will see about this property later. Why fluorescence? Side of David Jameson, that was a student in the Weber lab, a Gregorio Weber lab, it's pretty. So this is one reason. But the other reasons are that with fluorescent probes, you can be biochemically specific for macro certain macromolecules, but you can also have your molecule, so the fluorescent part of your molecule, that can be sensitive to these conditions. And so you can use this not only for understanding where a molecule is in the cell, but what is going on in the environment. Very flexible. And so you can use this for molecular structure and dynamics, cell organization and function. Uh, you can work in living animals. We will see, or most of you probably already know, or some of you don't know, but you can do this. And you, of course, you can work on engineering surfaces. Again, these are more or less the key points in the uh, excitation. Usually, so what you do is bring the molecule here, and then you have your molecule spending some time at this level, losing some energy, and then relaxing back from the lowest of the excited state down to the ground state. Now, we are now depicting the molecule as something that uh, works in a frozen condition, is not. Because we are working at room temperature. So it's really a mess what's going on here. And this is the reason why you have probabilities in excitation and probabilities in emission. It's something that is not blocked in one condition. Uh, and so you have to consider the probability of exciting your molecule. So you have what we call the excitation spectrum that in some cases overlay with the absorption spectrum of the molecule. And uh, if you consider a pure substance, you have to consider that uh, not only that the fluorescent spectrum is invariant, but also that it does not matter which is the wavelength you are using for exciting. When the molecule is in the excited state, the probability budget of relaxation is the same. So you don't have to care if you bring the molecule by temperature or by a chemical effect or by single photon excitation, two photon or three photon excitation. When the molecule is there, the probability of emission is the same for that molecule. And this guy is the one responsible of the description simplified, that we use as simplified description of the absorption and the emission process. And for some pure molecules, you have this mirror effect in absorption and emission. So you can predict also the emission from the absorption. 
If you go to some molecules that we use in biology, we have for tryptophan, we have the possibility of absorption and we have an emission that is in the blue. Uh, then you have other molecules, and including DNA, that you can label with the specific molecules like this one that allows you to have an absorption and a consequent emission in the visible. This is to say that uh, you can use light to deliver energy to a molecule that has the property of releasing energy releasing photons. And this is the mechanism we are interested in. But now if we have a look to the fluorescence decay, starting when you start exciting the molecule, uh, you can also have uh, an analogy with the radioactive decay, there is a lifetime associated. And we will discuss about this lifetime of the process. We will discuss about this because uh, temporal window for releasing photon from a fluorescent molecule is really strongly dependent by the environment conditions. And this can be good or not, but for most of the modern application of microscopy, this is extremely good. When we think about fluorescence and microscopy, I think that most of us, most of you, but most of us, including myself, think about intensity and a specific spectral window. But we have so many things that we can collect in fluorescence and that we can use for learning something from the molecules emitting that probably you cannot imagine, or you imagine but you didn't use. Now, there is a quantity that is quantum yield that tells you the efficiency of your molecule in converting the en in, in releasing back the energy. And so, as initial point, you can think that your molecule receives energy, and then when it is in the excited state, as most of you, can release the extra energy, I don't know, becoming red or crying. So becoming red, you see a signal. Crying, maybe you listen a sound. Uh, and the molecule can go to the ground state, releasing some temperature, so without any radiative decay, or releasing photons. This balance is the balance that you use this two possibilities, these two rates of deactivation of the molecules are the one of interest for defining the quantum yield, the molecule. You would like having a quantum yield one, but it's not. So let's assume that now you have uh, only two possibilities, so the fluorescence and the not fluorescent decay, this is the quantum yield, and we associate the lifetime to this ratio that depends on the possibility of the molecule of going to the ground state. This is relevant because let's assume that you have a molecule that is working in, I would like to say normal conditions, but not perturbed conditions. And so this molecule only has two possibilities. One is uh, going back without any photon released and going down the releasing photons. And then you can define a lifetime of the signal released by the photon that is the lifetime. If conditions around change, so this balance changes, so ki i changes, what happens is that tau changes. And so even if your molecule is emitting in the very same spectral region, let's say in the green, lifetime of the process is different. And if you're able to measure this quantity, you can map lifetime point by point, and you can find that 
your molecules, your fluorescent molecules, even if they emit at the very same wavelength, let's say green, they have a different lifetime telling you a story that is related to the environment. So this is an additional information that you have and that you can use. And you can refer here to the population of the excited molecules and to the variation of the this population of excited molecules in order to find a relationship that tells you which is the meaning of the lifetime that you can find in this final relationship. That is, the number of fluorescent molecules of photons released from the fluorescent molecules divided by the initial number in time, during time, is changing with this behavior. And we call this lifetime. 1 over e is where we find it. Okay. Now, can we measure this? Why not? So what we need to do is to shine, to send our energy to the system and to start collecting. If we start collecting, and this rule is true, what we collect is something like this. And so we can measure lifetime. There is a problem in this kind of approach. That is the, the kind of approach that people was using at the very beginning for lifetime measurements. Is that in order to have a good statistics, you need to collect a large number of photons. And in case you want to build an image that is, I don't know, 500 by 500 points, it takes a long time. And when it takes a long time and environmental condition changes, it's possible that uh, there is something that is changing in time and tells you and, and, and reports some changes in the lifetime. And so you can have a wrong view of what is going on on the overall system. We will see also tomorrow that we have solutions for removing this kind of problem. But however, this is very important. And uh, you can have measurements of lifetime in different ranges, as you can see here. And today, we are really able to measure changes in the range of nanosecond. You can perform this experiment in solution. So the environment is all the same. And you have an overall average condition in order to check which is the lifetime of your molecule under conditions that you are able to control. Then you move into the cell. And into the cell, you are not able to control anything. That's is, is a free running there for your molecules. So again, you can measure in this way. So sorry for this. Uh, and you have, uh, in this case, so you have the possibility of reporting point by point or measurement by measurement, which is the lifetime of your molecule. I don't remember if I'm too long here, maybe. The rest, one, sorry for this. I want to go to another point. Okay, this is always the very same story. Uh, I I would not comment or discuss now what's going on if you have uh, two lifetimes. So now we are talking about a molecule, and we are considering only one constant of decay. You are in condition that you have multiple lifetimes. Of course, you can uh, distinguish them, you can study them, you can separate them. Situation is more complicated, but you can manage it. But just telling you that lifetime is something that you can measure and that is relevant for understanding what's going on with your molecule. Is there another method than uh, exciting and counting in time for measuring lifetime? Yes, you can also use uh, a frequency method that works on the modulation of the light in time. And in this case, you, what you measure is something that you use to measure, that is the amplitude of your signal and the phase.
So what you can do is uh, to shine your excitation, to collect the emission, and to quantify the phase shift. The phase shift between excitation and emission, that is the temporal window of this phenomenon, can tell you something about the lifetime. It's not so precise as the measurements in time, but it's fast. And since it's modulated, signal to noise ratio is better. And so then you will have these slides, but we can demonstrate this. And we can demonstrate the relationship between phase and the lifetime. So these are the two main ways that you have for measuring lifetime. Sorry for this, I want to faster. Just showing you what uh, really means uh, having this possibility in terms of imaging. This is your intensity image for this sample. Doesn't matter the sample from my point of view now. Uh, however, it is a ciliated protozoa, and we were interested to understand what's going on in cilia uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of distribution of molecules. And, but if you measure the lifetime of the very same molecules that are producing fluorescence here, you see this distribution. This means that they are in a different environment, and they have different relationship with the sample. And since you have different, let's say, colors or different contrasts, you can have a better contrast in terms of image. Not an increase of resolution, but a better contrast. But now, since we are talking about uh, fluorescence, there is one aspect that is the one I was mentioning at the very beginning, that is the permanent loss of signal from a fluorescent molecule. This is photobleaching. Then you can have blinking, you can have other effects, but when we talk about photobleaching, according also to a textbook written by an Italian uh, photo, uh, uh, scientist in photochemistry, that is Bottieroli, photobleaching is uh, when you have lost completely any possibility of getting a signal in terms of photon from your fluorescent molecule. Of course, this happens because the molecule changes structure in time. So now, since you already discussed about microscopy, you can assume that you have a gel, three-dimensional gel, fluorescent. Okay. Within this gel, so this gel is three-dimensional. The view that you have here is z-axis, that is the axis of propagation of light, and x or y, okay? And now I'm shining light in the gel in a very small region. So I put my focus on my lens in a very small region in the three-dimensional object. I shine light until I consume all the fluorescent molecules, so until they photobleach all. If I do this, and I realize this when I see black here, if I have a look to my gel in the 3D, three-dimensional space, I realize that I bleached also the molecules where I was not interested in, and they were out of the focus of my lens. This is expected. Or, but can be unexpected when you perform your experiment. You wanted to probe something here, and then probably you decide, we will see later, and you have seen in the past days, we will move in another optical plane. But when we move in another optical plane, and we have this effect, we can get a wrong view of what's going on. Because, for example, let's assume that we have a big cell. You have some speculation about the fact that DNA is distributed in some way within this cell. 
you shine light in one focal region, and you see the signal, and you say, ah, the cell is alive. And then you move to another plane, and you don't see any signal from DNA, and you say, ah, this is a cancer cell. It's not. It's simply because the signal uh, photobleached before you moved there. So this process is an interesting process, but you have to take care when you attack your system in terms of fluorescence. So what's going on here is that you have uh, your molecule that is normally performing this game, but then in time, signal is fading, and you have the bleaching of the signal. Again, here is the same. And these are the processing, bringing the molecule outside from the scheme of getting an excitation and releasing a green, a red, or a blue photon for your image. Now, another bad point related to, to photobleaching is due to the fact that different molecules have different behaviors. And so it's possible that you have photobleaching at different, in different temporal windows molecule by molecule. This is another reason for taking care of this phenomenon. And we will see later when we will discuss about single molecules uh, what you can learn from, from photobleaching. And that is true that you can expect for an exponential decay of your signal in time while exciting using appropriate photons for bringing the molecule to the excited state. But this is really a key point also in the development we will see tomorrow of the super-resolved methods. You cannot escape from considering this problem of photobleaching there. Since behavior of the molecule is dependent on the environment, if you change the environment, so if you reduce the possibility of oxidization of your molecule, you can change photobleaching conditions. This is the reason why when you look to your fluorescent molecule, you can consider if you are looking your molecule in the cytosol or in a fixation that is using a certain substance like, I don't know, prolong. This is a way for reducing the production of molecular oxygen. And so what, what happens is that you have less photobleaching than in other cases. But again, Photobleaching is really a critical point when you're performing fluorescence measurements. Fluorescence again. Now, you know, you heard about, I assume that you had some uh, lessons about the optical side, from the optical side about to photon excitation. In this case, we are interested only on one aspect now, later on the other aspect about the instrument, but now about the fluorescent molecule. You have the nice possibility of bringing, following the Riego Permeyer prediction, of having the, your molecule in the excited state without delivering the appropriate energy. So let's assume that your molecule needs 10 in terms of arbitrary units to go to the excited state. You can deliver your energy 1 plus 9, 2 plus 8, 5 plus 5. 5 plus 5 is more practical. So using the very same uh, light source instead of using two different light sources. So let's assume that we use 5 plus 5 now. And so, and you can break your molecule in this way to the excited state. We will see that this is a game of ability because temporal windows of this event are not exactly the temporal windows uh, that we are able to manage in terms of waiting time or in terms of probability of the event. And uh, I will be back on this relationship later. 
but just telling you that uh, you have a temporal window that is very short and that you have a probability of the event that is related to several parameters that we will discuss uh, later for the, for the fluorescent molecule and later for the instrument. Uh, that make this possibility of exciting a molecule using two photons instead of using one photon of the appropriate energy. So let me say that this means moving to, from green to red for producing images. The overall effect you have, but I will be back on this immediately, uh, that you have is that when you want to excite molecules, this was the discussion we had before, just a few minutes before, you want to excite molecules here, you shine the appropriate light with appropriate energy, and so what you do is to excite all the molecules along the pathway, and you have higher density where you have higher density of photon. Nothing strange. When you move to two photon excitation, since the event is not a common event and requires, has a lot of requirements to be primed in terms of excitation. But the final effect is that you have excitation of fluorescence, so fluorescence only for a very small region. So you can be re you can really be selective. Just for fun, but uh, we call this two photon excitation. Uh, you can think that this is the Winnie Pooh philosophy in case. Uh, but despite the name, it's not a game made by using two photon. You need uh, a multitude of photon that go together in a cooperative way to the very same target. The name is two photon, but it's not two photon that. So you really need this. And you also need something special related to the temporal window. So you need to have the exact time of this event. Let's assume that here in this room, we organize a coffee break. And we give you the time for the coffee break. And uh, we ask uh, all of you coming into this room to send energy to a ball that is here on the ground and to provide an energy that is mg divided by 2 uh, with h. So half of the energy needed to bring the ball on the table. If you play this game, you come here, you play this game, an observer in this room will see probably always a ball at the half of the eight from the ground to the table. But now if we tell you that there is a coffee break and we tell you exactly at what time is the coffee break, since you know that if you arrive two minutes late, nothing is left, you will arrive all in time. You will provide, all of you will provide a, energy to this ball, and you increase the probability when you try to provide this energy to have the ball at half of the eight, and so being in the ball, the table. So you really need something telling you something about timing of this, increasing this probability with density. And uh, if we have a look to what happened in literature, now we we focus tomorrow, we will focus on these two years, but now you will see that you had uh, this prediction. In the 60s, you will see in the next slide, there was the demonstration of this effect. And Colin Shepard in 77 demonstrated the possibility of collecting a fluorescent signal exploiting this nonlinear interaction of light with a matter. So a two photon excitation. Uh, I assume that uh, he saw the signal and then the sample disappeared or something like that because of the high energy used in the focal region. But later, using different lasers, 
and a different approach. There was the first demonstration of the possibility of using this for biological system, and in particular, for neurons by Winfred Denk. So again, this was the story you have seen. And this is uh, part of the history related to, to photon excitation. And this year is the year where you had the experimental observation due to the fact that you had the invention of the laser. So a light source providing photons at a very high density. Now, in terms of interaction with your sample and what we can get here from the photon excitation, what is nice is that uh, if before we needed blue or ultraviolet, well, not ultraviolet, but 360, that is moving to the ultraviolet region, that is a dangerous region for the cell because you can induce changes, structural changes. You needed these for priming, for example, fluorescence in the marker of DNA. Now, you can use uh, 5 plus 5, so 720, 720. From the point of view of the sample, it's better because red light is absorbed definitely less, except for the window, water windows. In terms of the signal that you receive back, nothing changes. You have fluorescence, you have excitation process primed, so you have fluorescent molecules in the excited state, and so the relaxation follows the very same rule of the single photon excitation. Now, there was this calculation made by Denke Svoboda uh, and in case in a bright sunlight you are on a boat under the sunlight and you want to experience a single photon event in terms of fluorescence, your rate is more or less one second. But if you want to experience a two photon absorption event, we are talking about 10 million of years. In Italy we had only one person able to wait all this time in the past. He is still alive, but uh, we had only one. So. so in case you don't have this temporal window, you have to find a way for solving the problem. And the only way for solving this problem, for this event that is not uh, very common, is to increase the density of the photon. So organizing a coffee break with a lot of people around the molecule you're interested in. And so you are in this uh, high photon density region, and you have to work with time and space. Space, you have the lens. So the best is the lens, because the highest density is the, at the apex of your double cone, no matter. Time, you need uh, to produce this two photon or n photon effect uh, in a way that you are not changing due to the very high intensities that you need for having this in an observable, observable window in terms of time that do not destroy your molecule. So really you have to take care of the temporal aspect of your interaction. This is not in scale, of course, but uh, the solution found uh, in the Denk paper was uh, having very short pulses, high intensity. 10 minus 15 second means that the molecule is not able to change structure in this window. But you have, a, since the density is very high, you have a very high probability of bringing the molecule to the excited state. Then since fluorescence decays in 10 minus 9 seconds, this is the most common lifetime you have, not only because I'm from Genoa or other guys are from Scotland, so we don't want to waste too many photons, we don't want to try to excite the molecule while the molecule is in the excited state because this perturbation is strong in that 
temporal window. And so if you wait uh, 10 minus 8 seconds, you are sure that your molecules in case relax it back. And so in case you prime fluorescence on molecules that are not in the excited state. Otherwise, you can bring your molecule to the second excited state, or you can break your molecule or destroy your molecule. Okay, so this is the temporal window that people started using for two photon excitation. So back to this relationship. What we're interested in this relationship now is the relationship with the power you need or with the, dense, with the photons you need, with your illumination uh, source. Why we're interested in P and in the fact that you have this in this way. Because you are talking about two independent events that are the first and the second photon involved in. And if you treat these as two independent events, you have a, a consequence. I will be back on this formula later again. But you, so, OK, this is already discussed by this temporal window. Uh, the consequence you have is that uh, you have a quadratic effect that we will see soon. But if you assume that this is a cuvette containing fluorescent molecules, and this is what you perform in terms of excitation using the appropriate energy 10, you see the double cone inside the cuvette. When you move to two photon excitation, you have this event only in a very small region. Why? Because in this very small region, you have the highest probability of producing the event, or the highest probability of, of having photons from your illumination source. So again, with one photon excitation, you have this, uh, let's say, sketch in terms of excitation and emission. But wh when you have two photon excitation, excitation here, Density is too low for generating in an observable temporal window emission. And so you don't have any emission except from this focal point. Now, the consequence we are interested in are related to what's going on in terms of photobleaching. We started from photobleaching. Now, if you consider very same gel, and now if you switch off all the molecules for photobleaching in this region, and if you have a look of what's going on in the adjacent region, you discover that nothing happened. And so now when you move your focus and you find information on other optical planes, you are sure that apart from diffusion processes, you are dealing with new molecules. You are not consuming the molecules before observing them. And now there is uh, another aspect that is interesting in terms of uh, fluorescent molecule and the sample. And is related to cross-section. I don't know, I, I never found papers related to the prediction of the two-photon cross-section maybe only for one specific molecule under very specific condition. But modeling this is very complicated, and you cannot predict them. You can only measure this. And if you measure the cross-section under two-photon excitation, you find a different behavior from the case of the single molecule excitation. You have a dice. You have more probabilities of making 10, 5 plus 5, 3 plus 7, whatever you want. And the behavior you have can be very useful. But first, let's have a, another comment about this uh, cross-section. This cross-section cannot be predicted for, for a certain molecule, but you can have an estimate, a numerical estimate. Now, don't consider this part. Consider only the number. You start from 10 minus 16, that here you know what is. Huh? 
is a, a real cross-section, geometrically speaking. Now, if you start having a look to 10 minus 16, this tells you that working in fluorescence is nice for all the reasons we were trying to discuss before, but is not very efficient, 10 minus 16. When you move it to two photon, it's 10 minus 49. When you move to three photon, it's 10 minus 82, and so on. This means that your process has really a very poor efficiency. So exciting molecules, fluorescent molecules using two photon is not the best solution for exciting molecule in terms of getting a signal but could be the key solution for exciting molecules when you don't want to deal with overall photobleaching, when you want to penetrate deep in the sample and you're using red instead of blue, and when you have some other aspects that are related to your question and your need in terms of interaction with the sample. But in terms of fluorescence, is not the best way for producing fluorescence is more inefficient than the conventional way. But now, the behavior you find if you measure cross-section of different fluorescent molecules, here you have the cross-section in Gopper Meyer, is that cross-section is, is, not, is, not, is not a bell shape like in the case of single photon excitation. It's something that is broad across the spectrum. It's so broad that you have a lot of overlaps, molecule by molecule. This means something that you can use in a very uh, effective way when you're performing your measurements. If you need to excite different fluorescent molecules, Usually, you need different laser, or laser lines or different, let's say, colors or different illumination wavelengths. And you know that when you shine in matter, you try to focus in the matter different wavelengths, they have not the focus in the very, in the very same position. And most of the time, what you need from your multiple fluorescence is to understand if some molecules are, in the very, are interacting. So you don't like this dub that you have, even if you have a chromatic aberration correction, uh, all the correction that, it, and you can put everything in the right track after your measurement. But you have that problem. And you need, three illumination sources that are fluctuating in a different way and that are delivering different energies. But now when you move to two photon, you can use one illumination source for priming fluorescence in different fluorescent molecules. And then you collect your signal. You have only one problem here and we will face with this problem immediately after these slides. You need to be very sharp in spectral separation. Because now you're shining your excitation. If in a certain region we have three molecules, they will emit photon altogether. Your detector does not know anything about the wavelength, usually about the wavelength of the photon, and you need to find a good way for separating, in terms of energy, their contribution in order to be able to distinguish them. So spectral separation is something that uh, is a key word in two photon excitation. So this is uh, just an example with the very same wavelength. You can get the three colors coming from different region from DNA, from the cytoskeleton, and from filaments. And you have a different collection of tables 
that are reporting about the wavelength ranges for two photon excitation. Here, you have another surprise. Nice surprise. That is that when you move to two photon excitation, now having in mind a rule that is not true, but is uh, practical. I mean, it's not true if you go to the formulas, if you go to the real structure of the molecule, uh, is a rule of thumb, some way. The rule is that if I shine 720, it's like exciting 360. Okay. It's like exciting 360. But through my sample, it's passing light at 720. Only in the focal region, I have an effect that is exactly like if I am shining in a very precise position, 360. So I'm affecting a very small region. Just to give you an idea, in terms of capacity of water, this is 10, uh, 0.01 femtoliter. This is the amount that you are in some way perturbing with your excitation considering the, the ultraviolet component. And so you are able to excite molecules like NADH that on one side can be excited into ultraviolet. On the other side, these, mo these molecules are related to the metabolic activity. Okay. So it's like, uh, I mean, per if you use ultraviolet and you check an ADH, you are perturbing a lot the system, and at the very same time, you are looking for the natural metabolic activity. It's good, but it's not the best. It's like asking someone to sing and to hit him or her with a hammer. The way he sings, I think, changes. And this is what happens with the cell. But in this case, you have the possibility of using a perturbation that is a low level in terms of perturbation with the cell. And so you can get this signal. But now there is another effect. If you are able now to excite this kind of uh, intrinsic signal from the sample. Let's assume that you are using single photon excitation. For the scheme we have shown before, even if this signal autofluorescence is poor, is distributed throughout for all the cell. And so if you are able to prime this, you have a lot of background with a very poor signal in the focal region. But now, when you're moving to two photon excitation, you have a poor signal because autofluorescence is not very bright. But it's coming only from a very small region. So background is strongly reduced. And so if you shine a different focal position, your excitation, this is autofluorescence coming from membranes sample you see from every region a good contrast image changing plane by plane without contamination of the background in using autofluorescence. In case you are shining uh, 360 here or something like that, you would see a blob. Then you can use a pinhole and your confocal for reducing something, but it's a blob. In this case, you can really discriminate plane by plane what's going on using this kind of excitation. Now, point here is that uh, your detector is uh, old-fashioned uh, movie cinema amateur, so he's only looking for black and white movies. And uh, Ah, sorry, there was a light, okay. You have seen that colors are some way relevant. 
you are interested in your technicolor image. And from the side of your sample, uh, if you collect only without any spectral uh, discrimination, the signal coming from different biological molecules, you really don't know what you have there. It's a little bit a mess. Uh, it's better if you go to the Pink Floyd side, and so you're able to select colors. And so the key now for fluorescence microscopy, any method, especially when using two photon excitation, is the ability of separating spectral information. This is what you can get from different fluorescent molecules. Information is interesting. It can be morphological one. You can say something related to, even if it's poor, the contrast here about intensity distribution, so can tell you something. But maybe this information is better if you're able to produce this without artifacts and in an appropriate way, because this tells you not only something about morphology, but about specificity of the molecule, and in some cases about their function in the sample. Now you have different ways for selecting colors. You can use colored glasses. This is a good way. This means that uh, you are filtering your spectral information, blocking light you are not interested in. One problem you have when you are using these glasses is that uh, if you are interested, I don't know, in the red signal, it's true that uh, this filter is killing all the other colors, more or less, if they are not too strong. If they are not reflections, for example, from your excitation. But it's also true that it's not transmitting red color 100%. And so you are also losing some signal. It's a good method. But some disadvantages. If you go to your grandmother or grandfather house, you can find something having prisms uh, with lights. And when the light enters in from the sunlight, you have a really romantic and nice view. Uh, and you can use this kind of element for spectrally separating light. And then when you have uh, separated light in terms of color, and they're shining colors in different positions, so you have the spectrum distributed in space, you can decide when, where you, you have to place your photodetectors in order to collect the blue light, the red light, or the light you're interested in. And so prism could be a good way for separating colors. Then you can have uh, other, other separation methods, for example, a diffraction grating. Again, with the diffraction grating, you can separate colors, and then you can collect them in different channels. One problem I see here for the elements you have at your disposal today is that you are losing a lot of light when separating colors using a diffraction grating. So it's not transmission 100%. It's not the prism, but the prism is better in this. And so you have different solutions in different uh, systems using this method for separating light. Just showing you some of them in different commercial systems. Sorry for this, but uh, so you, you can separate in different colors and into different channels taking care about polarization in order to get uh, uh, a better signal. You have different solution. But this tells you, these are, let's say, new generation, but mid of 2000, uh, 2005 from 2005, 2010, tells you, tell you how relevant is the ability of separating spectral components when you perform modern fluorescence or advanced fluorescence uh, microscopy. 
every time you have uh, to consider this solution, you have also to try to consider how much light you are losing while collecting different colors. I'm showing this, but also for all the others, it's the same, more or less. You have a chain. So usually what happens is that uh, you receive light, different wavelengths, then you start selecting one, and then other components are passing to another element, so on, and you're losing every time light and more light. I, I will give you a number later. Uh, light and more light for the spectral window you are interested in, because every step you are not gaining photons, you are losing photons. Uh, this, for example, well, in terms of uh, system, I like this method because you have a grating here. It, you lose a lot of light here, but it's nice. The idea was nice because you have. Uh, a single detector, you have a grating that is on a galvo mirror. And so this grating is moving fast. And uh, if you decode time, so time is in some way encoding the spectral component, time of deflection. So for any position, you have a different color sent to the photomultiplier. And in case your detector is not a photomultiplier that has some uh, capacity effects in terms of when you change the voltage, if you, have, if you have a fast detector, you can also change the sensitivity of the detec detector according to the different budget of photons at that wavelength. Because it's true that when you have your sample, if you work uh, with a fixed sensitivity, with a block sensitivity, you can get lost. You could have saturation for some wavelengths and the poor signal for other wavelengths. So these are stupid practical aspects, but relevant when you have to say something about your sample. And so today, however, we are able to collect the real time colors and separated colors using. Uh, using optical microscope. And in this case, this is a spectral separation of eight colors from the very same sample, the very same simultaneously. Again, fluorescence. With fluorescence, now you can. You can have uh, what I would call several dimensions or several possibilities. You can have a fluorescence lifetime measurements. We will see later what about FRET, that is an advanced fluorescent method. You can also have information about diffusion of your molecule in different ways that are fluorescence recovery after photobleaching and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. And then you can move to second single molecule detection and then you have uh, another mechanism of contrast that is not related with fluorescence, but is related to the way you are producing fluorescence when using, for example, two photon excitation. And so we can talk about seven dimensions. You have optical sectioning, confocal, selective plane of illumination to photon, and these other methods for the three dimensions. So you can have a really <coughs> three-dimensional view of your sample. But this is not the reason we are using the optical microscope. Well, it's one of the reasons, because with the optical microscope, we don't need to physically to make physical sections on our sample. The real reason is that we are able to introduce the fourth dimension that is that is time, so you can follow events in time. This is the advantage of using fluorescent and not uh, visible light. And so also for big sample, you can follow development of biological systems from embryos to adult stages. It's something that you cannot get with any other instrument. And when you use fluorescence, 
especially in a special way, you can really track what's going on in your living system. And so you can better understand not only a normal or a pathological state, but you can also understand which is the effect of a pharmacological, for example, uh, effect or a surgical effect in real time. Colors, that tells you something about the specificity of the molecule and function. And when you use lifetime, you can see, as you have seen before, you can distinguish objects using a different mechanism of contrast. And then you can use something that comes for free when you perform to photon excitation. Since you are shining a very high intensity there, you can appreciate the, a signal called second harmonic generated signal. And this signal, so if you shine red, you receive blue. Uh, this signal is relevant because, for example, in this case, this is the tail of a zebra fish, that is a small fish. Now, people was inserting here fluorescent molecules. And now there is one general comment about people working in fluorescence. That now that we are moving to super resolution becomes more evident. People working in fluorescence, they trust on what they label. So no way. So when they see a green signal, this green signal comes only from the macromolecules K57F that they have labeled. It is not very often they have dubs on this. Sometime, people try to find some uh, biological fiducial in the sample, that is the nucleus, and so they tell you, please, can you give me an image of the nucleus in, in order to understand if what I, I think I've labeled is there, is where it has to be, but nothing more. Now, there are some uh, uh, biological components like collagen or some other that exhibit second harmonic generation. So they change properties of light in a way that you can detect. And this is the case. So in this case, you can see the muscle fibers of the tail in purple. And in green, you can see what you have labeled in terms of fluorescence. And we will see we can go to single molecule and to nanoscopy. But now, since we are talking about advanced fluorescence, we cannot escape from the fact that there is a new category of fluorescent molecules that are available. These fluorescent molecules are also responsible for some, uh, uh, for some reason of the development of super-resolved fluorescent methods. Green fluorescent protein. So like this name tells you, they are protein. This means that biologists, people in biochemistry, they are able to induce the expression of this protein wherever they want. So they can control a process, expression of a protein in a biological system. The other property is that they are green fluorescent. So you can also see them. As you know, these three guys got the Nobel Prize in 2008. This guy, for understanding a mechanism switching on fluorescence in a specific mechanism of calcium release uh, due to a green fluorescent protein, later discovered and uh, uh, isolated. Martin Chalfi was the one with his wife, Tule Azerig, Understanding that this protein can be, could be expressed in any mammalian cell. No limits in this. 
Roger Chen understood, not only this, but understood that photophysics of the molecule could be also controlled. And so you can imagine, just as the simplest effect of this understanding, that the emission color could be controlled, changing only some element in the expression of this protein. But what is relevant here is that, for example, Martin Schalfi wanted to understand the, the development of the uh, neuronal system in the Cernobilis elegans world. Or since you have the development of this protein and expression in time in living system, is something that is, you, you don't have to inject. You don't have to stop situation and injecting. You can use this for following behavior of living systems while they're living. So you can assume that you have an experiment with a tumor mass that is injected with green fluorescent proteins. And you can see this big mass in terms of fluorescence in the mice. And then you can start with the treatment, and you can see this mass diminishing or increasing. So you can really track what's going on in living systems. But the big jump in terms of advanced fluorescence microscopy we had here was with the advent of photoswitchable fluorescent molecules, uh, green fluorescent proteins. This was the real jump. Both Mörner and Betzig, when they had uh, their own studies on single molecule uh, detection, they were in troubles because they were not able to control states. But with photoactivable, you can control states of the molecules. And if you can control states, you can, for example, switch on some fluorescent molecules in a mother. And then when this mother cell is dividing, you can follow part of the, of the mother cell propagating in daughter cell, recognizing the fluorescent signal that can come only from the region of the mother cell that you have photoactivated. So you can really, in a living system, you can switch on something and then you can follow in the lifetime and, and in. And so single molecule is relevant now with, with this for green fluorescent protein. And uh, not too much time. So tomorrow I will have some other topics to discuss with you that I'm not able to, to bring in this short time now. Uh, but I want to touch this point. Now, fluorescence, the single fluorescent, the for artificial fluorescent molecules, green fluorescent molecules. Now, it's relevant to try to understand something about the behavior of single fluorescent molecules. Because when we are dealing with a single molecule that is emitting, we can improve our ability in localizing, for example, this molecule uh, of this factor, that is the number of photon emitted. In case the protein is singing, well, the amount of sound sent, but from a single molecule that is the only one talking to you time by time. Now there is one point. How do we recognize single molecules? Because these molecules are small. I mean, so a green fluorescent protein has 27 kilodalton. This means that it's more or less uh, occupies five nanometers in space, depending on how is uh, on the surface or in the sample. And uh, in case you are able to, in case you have single molecules on a cover slip, and you follow this single molecule in time, you can learn a lot in terms of photobleaching behavior and some other properties of the molecule. And you have different ways for 
getting images from single molecule. You can have conventional illumination. These are single molecules, or could be single molecules. Or you can have uh, a surface illumination. I don't know if you talked about turf, but you have an illumination occurring only at the surface. Or you can have some other mechanism reducing some background. But more or less, this is what you get. Now, and this condition is a condition where the density of the single molecule is not very high. Now, do you have any tool or any idea for understanding if you are dealing with a single molecule or not? Because when you have them, in this case, for example, the, stru okay. the structure is not resolved, but you are always within the, your diffraction limit. One experiment you can make is to have a very poor concentration of fluorescent molecule spread on a cover slip. Now, if your experiment is so nanomolar, so in case your experiment is well done, first of all, there is no reason for the molecules of aggregating. I mean, in terms of surface charge, they should not aggregate. But this can happen. But in general, no, no reason. And if your solution is uh, at a very poor concentration and you put your molecules on a cover slip using uh, some spinning strategy or whatever you want uh, for putting them on the cover slip. And now you measure the intensity of each spot. You can have a distribution of intensities. Again, if the experiment is well done, it's possible that you have uh, a majority population made by molecules having the poorest signal, and then you have multiple of this signal. The experiment is well done, this is what would happen. And in this case, you can recognize on your cover slip, or in your system, by intensity, where the single molecules are. So are the only ones having one as signature. But now, and so this is the real situation. It's not exactly what we have seen there. This is the experiment, in this case, with one micromolar. And this is what you get. And these are the categories you can have using fluorescence intensity. But do you have uh, another possibility for understanding that, for example, I don't know if it's one, but this one is a single molecule. What could you do for being sure? Because a single molecule will be the key word for the super resolution method, but not only. Also for learn something by single molecules. And you want to be sure that you are dealing with a single molecule. Do you remember photobleaching? Well, if you shine light in time, you have a signal from your single molecule, and then this signal drops down in this way. If you have more than seven molecules, they will not stop emitting photons altogether, and so you will have an exponential decay. And if you want, if you have a small amount of molecules, so if your aggregate is an aggregate made by from one to 10 molecules, you can, by counting steps, you can count the number of molecules. So using photobleaching, you can understand if you're dealing with one molecule, a small aggregate, or a large aggregate. And this is a fluorescent property. Uh, for those of you that are performing atomic force microscopy and force spectroscopy, probably you do the same. So you pull. And, and when you have a look to your force spectroscopy curve, you have steps telling you if you have one molecule or more than one molecule. It's, is the same because it's always something related to the energy needed or released by the system. Then you have another possibility 
that is very interesting that is used in polarization. Why not? This is an oscillating dipole. And so if you turn, if you have a single molecule, if you turn your polarizer and the molecule is immobile, what happens is that you have a, a signal that can switch from zero to the maximum in 90 degrees. If not, it's an aggregate of molecules. So you really have tools for understanding if you're dealing with single molecules or not. And so now that you have this tool, you can start studying properties of single molecules in order to use them, for example, in advanced fluorescence microscopy. I, I will be back on this tomorrow, but let me go until only the end of this part in past, and then tomorrow I can discuss more about this, okay? If you agree. Uh, this was, uh, okay, th th this is the green fluorescent protein. And this was uh, a variant of this molecule. Uh, the guy introducing this was Mauro Giacca. Uh, this molecule has a mutation here. And what is relevant, I will be back in case on this tomorrow. I'm not sure, but I will. What is relevant is that uh, this molecule, under two photon, I will tell you the story under single photon tomorrow in case, but under two photon, you have this molecule having emission, bleaching, then if after bleaching, you shine different energy to the molecule, in this case a very sharp window that is 720 nanometer, this molecule restores its fluorescence. At that time, I don't remember which time, but it was around 2004, we were thinking we had in our hands something for studying single molecules in an advanced way in cells. The only problem we had, in fact we stopped just for a while, and too much, and so others came with other molecules, was that, uh, imagine, we have to bring the cell expressing this molecule, this green fluorescent protein. We see the signal. We photobleach, this, this was the critical point, we had to photobleach all the sample and then restore fluorescence only in the region we were interested in and using a dose of energy able to restore fluorescence only in one molecule or few molecules time by time. So this was the idea. But the fact that we had to photobleach all the sample, we had too many discussions with biologists and so we stopped. Then you have in 2005, Following the paper by Jennifer Lipico Schwartz and uh, George Patterson, we decided to apply the very same to this photoativable GFP. And uh, here, I can tell you the story, it's shorter. Uh, this is your common GFP. This is the mutated GFP. You see from this excitation spectrum that if you shine light, in this, you don't have signal here. But then if you photoactivate this GFP, photoactivate means under single photon that using four or five, you use a decarboxylation in the protein. This changes the structure and the spectrum, excitation spectrum changes, <coughs> changes in this way. And so your protein becomes uh, visible. But the great advantage here is that you start dark and you go bright. In that case, we started bright, we had to bring everything dark and then coming bright again. So one process more, like when you fly, one stop more. 
So this was the situation. This is the situation uh, for this uh, molecule. And if you have a look, th there was something that people started, under started understanding with the wild type GFP, but the effect was not so great as for the PA GFP. So they stopped. Uh, now, what is relevant here is that you can create a population of labeled protein in a specific region. The only point, this is the reason why we decided to try this under two photon, is that uh, if you remember the graphical sketch about two photon and single photon, if you use a single photon photoactivation, you have a good probability of photoactivating molecules outside the region you are interested in. And we were interested in a desired region. So again, this is what, what happens when you perform this photoactivation using single photon. And we decided to do this under two photon. And this is what you can get. So you can be uh, specific in space. You can really select the region here. Uh, will be better in the next slide. In OK, maybe here. I don't know. You can, if this is the shape of your cell, you can decide switching on only in volumes you're interested in. You can measure your point spread function and whatever you want, the, the, the region, the amount of, uh, of proteins that you're able to switch on. You can control this photoactivation. And this is the reason why we were able to switch on in a precise way, molecules within the nucleus, that was the histone H2B in this case, following what's going on in the daughter cells. And so following an event in other cell. In case we were priming photoactivation using single photon, we were not sure that the portion of DNA in the nucleus we wanted to check in the division was the one we were interested in. And just to finish now, this is my last slide this morning. Uh, we decided to apply this also to this problem. We wanted to understand something about trafficking in a cell. So we had molecules in a vesicle. And there were inhibitory or not of a process, depending on the substances you released, on a process of uh, transportation of this molecule to the membrane. It took two years, more or less, understanding this. But then we were able to switch on the molecules only in a vesicle. And so in the next stages of development of the cell, when we were able to, found, to find them in the membrane, the signal could come only from the one we switched on in the vesicle. So in this case, you are able to increase the, the, what is giving you fluorescence, because you have the, the, a protein that you can express wherever you want. You can adapt to this protein a signal that is the green fluorescent protein. You can switch on this when you need. And with two photon, you can be very sharp in the region where you switch on your molecule. And so if you, want, if you have now have a question related to a process in the cell from one region to the other, you can use this for approaching. Your. Then with fluorescence, it's not only for margaritas, but you can, uh, and you can get for a lot of fluorescence here, but you can, uh, this is the, what we think is the, is, the, is the way for nanoscale, for getting nanoscale information from your biological systems. Uh, tomorrow, maybe I will start with FRET and FRAP, and then I will move to nanoscopy. Sorry for being so long this morning. But I wanted, since I didn't know which was the, I want to have uh, 
something that is uh, for everybody the same. And tomorrow, I would like to try to talk about threat frap and nanoscopy, or starting with nanoscopy and then coming back to this topic. Uh, maybe we can discuss which is the topic you prefer more, if threat or frap or, or nanoscopy. If you have questions, or we can get our coffee and we can discuss here. I don't know. I don't know what you do. Uh, is the language. Thank you very much.